So I've lived in London for over 30 years and in this video I want to show you the 10 must-see sites, the iconic postcard sites of London. What's important about them is also they will cost you absolutely nothing to see. And so the first site is the Palace of Westminster, also known as the House of Parliament. Inside are the House of Commons and the House of Lords. It's a very beautiful building. One of the big misconceptions, of course, is about Big Ben, the clock tower. Big Ben is actually the name of the bell inside the tower that chimes. And the tower is called the Queen Elizabeth Tower, named after Queen Elizabeth II when she entered her 60th year of reign. And just across from Big Ben, you'll see the South Bank, which is a popular tourist stretch with things like Sea Life Aquarium. And also you'll find the London Eye, which is that massive big Ferris wheel that's become such an iconic site, particularly at New Year. And so just behind me is Admiralty Arch, and behind that is one of the most famous sites of London, Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square was named after the Battle of Trafalgar during the Napoleonic Wars, when the British were battling the French and the Spanish, and won just off a place called Trafalgar. And of course it has Nelson's Column, it has the lions guarding it, and also it has a number of plinths with statues. The fourth one, which always remains empty and has different and rotating pieces of artwork. And of course, no trip to London would be complete without a visit to Buckingham Palace. This is the official home of the monarchy, and they spend quite a lot of time here, although Windsor Castle, about 20 miles outside of London, is a real big favourite. You can tell if the Queen is in residence because the Royal Ensign, which is a, a gold and red ensign flag, will be flying above Buckingham Palace. If it's just the Union Jack, it means that the monarchy is not in residence. So during changing the guard, the old guard is basically replaced by the new guard. The new guard arrived from Wellington Barracks, normally accompanied by a band. And it's lots of pomp, lots of ceremony. If you're here during summer, you can also tour the state apartments and the gardens, which is a real must-do. So if you're here sort of July, August time, it's worth checking online to search for Buckingham Palace tickets. And I'd strongly recommend going on a tour because you get great insights into the royal family, the way they live, and of course you get to see places that very few people actually get to see. And of course another really important part of a visit to Buckingham Palace is the Queen Victoria Memorial which just sits just opposite the palace itself. And so after Buckingham Palace it's time to head to our next stop which is Tower Bridge and the Tower of London. So we're going to head back down the Mall. But by the way, two things that you're going to need if you want to do this tour of the best sites of London is a good pair of walking shoes and also one of these, which is an Oyster card. It's a prepaid card that you can use on all the buses and all the tubes. Just pick it up at the underground station, you load it up with money, and the great thing is it caps and only charges you the lowest fare possible for all of the trips you do. And so once you get to Tower Hill Tube Station, you're at some of the most important sites of London, including the Tower of London behind me and Tower Bridge. So let me tell you a little bit about the Tower of London. Its official name is actually a Royal Palace and Fortress of the Tower of London, and it has a reputation for being a very violent place. However, not that many people were actually executed here because executions used to take place on Tower Hill across the other way. However, it has been used for all sorts of things, including obviously a prison, it's been used as an armory, it's been used as a public records office. The Royal Mint used to be here, and still within those walls are the crown jewels, and they are a real must see. Now the tower actually held prisons from about 1100 right through to 1952. The Cray brothers, which were famous East End gangsters, were apparently some of the last prisons ever held here. It was most renowned for holding prisoners in the 16th and 17th century when everyone from Elizabeth I to Sir Walter Raleigh were held right here and that's where the expression sent to the tower came from. During the First World War and Second World War it was also used to hold uh, various uh, enemies of the state and in fact some people were actually executed in here for espionage. One of the more famous sites of London is behind me right now, it's the Tower Bridge. It opened in 1895 and connects the north and the south side of London with of course the Thames flowing underneath. It's a magnificent building. Now walking across Tower Bridge is going to give you one of the most magnificent views you can possibly have of London. You get to look right up the river towards London, it really is quite magnificent and if you can see that behind me with the river behind me. Now from Tower Bridge you can see many of the more recent and modern buildings of London that are starting to 
basically pop up around the skyline. So you have the Shard, which is a massive tall building and has the tallest observation platform in Europe. Also behind me, you've got the London Assembly, where the mayor has his office, and HMS Belfast, which was a old World War II battleship. Behind me, on the other side there, you have the City of London, which is the heart of the financial centre, and you have buildings which are effectively known as the walkie-talkie, the cheese grater, and the gherkin. And so visiting London in summer, one of the things you'll very quickly realise, it's very busy wherever you go. I mean, it's just crowds and crowds of people everywhere. But uh, normally it's nice and sunny like this, and it's quite good fun, so it's still great. And so once you've had time at the Tower of London and Tower Bridge, it's time for the next big site, which is St Paul's Cathedral. So here I am in the gardens of St Paul's. I'm doing it in the gardens at the back because it's a little bit quieter here than out the front. St Paul's is a very significant cathedral. It's where all the major uh, events take place like fun state funerals for example, uh, the marriage of uh, Prince Charles and uh, Princess Diana was here and also big celebrations like the Queen's Jubilee. It's on Ludgate Hill which is the highest point in the City of London, the heart of London and until 1967 it was actually the tallest building in London, built by Sir Christopher Wren of the Great Friar of London and even during World War II as bombs fell all around London, surprisingly the dome on uh, St Paul's uh, remained and it became like a beacon of hope through the whole of the Second World War. So unfortunately I can't show you inside although it is free to get inside because you can't take videos or any pictures there. One of the challenges when you're outside seeing in London is trying to find somewhere to go to the loo and so that's another big plus for things like Starbucks and places like that. Most of the public toilets you end up paying about 50p to go and spend a penny which is what I'm about to go and do. And so after St Paul's the next stop which is not that far away is Millennium Bridge which also is affectionately known as the Wobbly Bridge. When it opened in June 2000 it had to be closed the same day because people found as they walked over it it basically swayed and made them seasick. It took two years to fix before it was reopened and so the Millennium Bridge has become a major tourist attraction. It attracts lots of people because it, it takes you from one side of the Thames to the other. You've got St Paul's on the one side and you have Tate Modern which is a free gallery on the other side in a very, in a very beautiful old art deco power station. Now all along this stretch of the river which is sort of the south bank of the Thames there's always lots of activity, lots of people hanging around, lots of events, stalls, that kind of stuff. So it's always good if you wanted to stop, have something to eat or just simply relax after this frantic sightseeing. And so my next tip in terms of must-see sites is Hyde Park. It's a massive park. It's one of the big four parks in London. And the big parks, the big royal parks are connected. So you have Kensington Gardens, you have Hyde Park, you have Green Park, and that eventually leads to St James's Park. Now many people say that you can pretty much walk across London on greenery. I don't know if that's entirely true, but there's a lot of green space in London. And Hyde Park is one of the most important. There's a couple of key things within Hyde Park that you can see. There's a Serpentine, which is a lake that sort of splits Hyde Park into two. The Speaker's Corner, which is very famous, particularly on the weekend when people gather and it's a chance to do free speech and talk about anything you want to talk about, get heckled, get jeered, whatever. And then also down towards the sort of Knightsbridge side of Hyde Park, you'll also find two very important buildings, one of which is the Albert Memorial, which Queen Victoria built in uh, honour of her lost husband. And across the road from that is the magnificent and circular Albert Hall, which is where big concerts are held, and particularly the proms every year are held. And so as we head to our next site, one of the things I want to do is give you a little tip based on what I've been seeing today. As I've been traveling around, I've heard so much uh, incorrect information spoken about the sites, the history, etc. So what I would do is I've tried to give you a short overview in order to each of the links, but I'd strongly recommend, you know, get a good guide book or certainly find a reputable site online. I'll put some links in the notes and make sure that you have a good sense of what you're actually seeing and try not to listen to some of the bizarre ideas and thoughts and explanations you hear as you go around. And so my next must-see site is the British Museum. It was established in the 1700s and over the last two and a half centuries it's collected over eight million items. It focuses on human history, arts and culture and it has a couple of uh, controversial pieces or areas within it such as uh, the Parthenon statues where there's a constant discussion between Greece and the UK about their return. 
However, the collection here is amazing and two of the most popular areas are the Egyptian areas, including a display of mummies and also, of course, the Elgin marbles as they used to be called or the Parthenon sculptures. Like all museums in the UK, the British Museum is free, although they do ask if you will make a donation, but it, you don't have to if you don't want to. And so our next site is actually a collection of three things. It's a collection of three amazing museum buildings. And of course, the museums inside them are also awesome and quite amazing. The first is the Natural History Museum. It has over 80 million specimens, and it's best known for its dinosaurs, which uh, are a big hit with kids. Over five million people visit it a year. Across the road is the V&A. It's the world's largest decorative arts museum, and named after Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And both of these were opened in the 1850s. It's a great museum. It's probably one of my favorite museums, if not my favorite museum, in London. A little bit up the road from that is the Science Museum, which is a very hands-on interactive museum. It gets about three and a half million visitors a year. It's great for kids because it really immerses them into science and lets them get their hands kind of uh, involved and grubby, if you like. So just going to look at the buildings themselves is amazing. They're all together in South Kensington in the west of London. But again, you can get in for free. All museums are free and you could spend you know, days probably in each of them. No Stop in London is complete without stopping off in Harrods. It is over five acres in Knightsbridge. It has 330 departments and apparently sells everything you could possibly want. It used to be owned by uh, Mohammed Al-Fayed, whose son Dodi was actually in a relationship with uh, Lady Diana when they both died in a car crash in Paris. It's now actually controlled by the Qataris. So as I said, I've lived in London for over 30 years. I adore the city and hopefully you'll find those 10 must-see sites absolutely fantastic and really helpful. I try to choose the sites that are iconic sites that really represent London and also that you can see without actually having to pay to do anything other than of course your transportation. A couple of things I'd really like you to do. First of all, I'd love you to leave a comment and let me know which of those sites you love the most if you've ever been to London or are looking forward to seeing the most. Secondly, it'd be great if you left a thumbs up on the video. It would also be great if you could subscribe and every week I try and release a new video with travel inspiration, advice, tips and money saving ideas to help you make the most of your precious vacation time and money. Mm -hmm.